So good morning. Good morning. Good to be here. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the weather out there. Isn't that just awesome? Yeah. Where has that been? So good to be here this morning. Um, Southminster Presbyterian Church. We are a open and inclusive congregation. That simply means wherever you are on life journey or on life's path journey, you are welcome in this place. Just to let you know that a copy of today's Zoom service is always on our website, posted on Monday morning. And if you're not already on the email list, we have a newsletter that goes out every Thursday with everything that's happening. This weekend, for one, has been so busy with Mariners and rebuilding together and Viva Village and the mission orientation. We are back, I believe, as a church. So a couple announcements that I will uh, call your attention to. Remember, at the end of the aisles are these beige friendship paths. Please do fill them out. Let us know that you're here. That would be great. The silent auction last week was a huge success, uh, raising over $10,000. Thank you. And a special thank you to three people, Kathy Ludwig, and Kathy is going to um, also thank two other people that were very instrumental. So, Kathy. those great items if you hadn't donated so thank you and then thank you for buying all those items right back because that's the way it works <laughs> so thank you for your generosity of spirit um, and making this such a success and so if is Claudia here Claudia McClure She's online. Claudia's oh. online Claudia we have some flowers here for you in the sanctuary that hopefully you can pick up um, this week from Lisa and a card. And then Susan, will you please come up front? Susan was tremendous. She showed up for setup, she called, she recruited. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And, um, and then the third person, of course, was our wonderful Lisa McQuilliam. She was amazing. She was here many late hours in the evening helping me sort items and put bid sheets on things. Um, and her daughter was printing out um, certificates. So Lisa, wherever you are, thank you. And you have flowers on your desk in the office. And then while I'm up here, can I do another plug? Okay. Okay. <laughs> June 5th. Sunday, we'd love our children's families to stay after church, have lunch with us, and help us plant flowers in our children's gardens because they were beautifully weeded on Grubby Saturday. They're ready for plantings. So thanks to Chris Muzong, we are all set, and Robin Burnham, we're all set with um, starts and plants ready to plant in the garden. So we'd invite those families to stay after church, stay and have lunch with us. We'll provide the lunch, we'll provide the plants, we've got the garden tools and then hopefully just an hour of some fun together in the sunshine, we can get our garden planted. There'll be announcements to come, so. All right, thank you, Kathy. And in case you're wondering, I've already given her many hugs and kisses for the amazing <laughs> person she was in um, making that auction happen, so thank you, Kathy. Just um, if you have not picked up your items or paid for your items, there are a few items still in Pearson Gallery. There are a few items that were not bid on. Give us your best offer and it is yours. And the money tree is still available if you're um, interested in that. So another announcement, adult education. Um, meets again on Zoom tomorrow night, still with their theme of the pre-exilic prophets. And tomorrow night, they're looking at Isaiah and Jeremiah. So May 23rd, Monday, 7 p.m. on Zoom. And then finally, we have a special guest with us, and I will have Michelle Muniz stand up we're going to hear from Michelle um, a little bit later in the minute for mission. She has come to us all the way from Puerto Rico and has spent the weekend with our Puerto Rico mission team. There were about 35 of us in the sanctuary Friday night, Saturday, and she helped do the orientation, getting us prepared for that mission week. And she also went down downtown to the Blanche House with four youth and myself last night. So she experienced some of our local mission as well. So we look forward, she'll be giving a minute for mission in just a few moments. So today's reader is Sandy Ruff, and Ken Wilson on piano, Stephen Schaefer leading the choir, Chase Ryan, our technical director, and the beautiful flowers were given by Michael Hawkins. So thank you, Michael. So let's take a moment to pause. Healing does not mean going back to the way things were before but rather allowing what is now to move us closer to God. For all who are able, please stand and join Sandy in the call to worship. Good, mo good morning, all. The words today for the call of worship are by Joan Stott. Healing God, we come together in our brokenness to call to you in your mercy to make us whole again. Wholeness giving God, listen to our prayers, we pray. Restoring God, we gather to worship you even as we hopefully seek to be renewed and restored again. God, a quiet center, prayers this day. Foundational God, we come to praise and thank you. In the depths of your holy being, we find peace and rest. God, our beginning and our end, we will always be. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I like that. Sometimes I say good morning, and everyone's like, oh, I don't know, it's too early. So I'm glad that you're all awake. Um, I'm so happy and so thrilled to spend the weekend uh, with Southminster um, to get to see some of the faces that we'll see uh, during the summer. So know that I've been having a great time with this congregation. My name is Michelle Muniz. I'm currently the Disaster Recovery Coordinator for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. Um, you can call it PDA. For those of you who are not familiar with the work of PDA, it's part of the Presbyterian Church USA mission agency, um, and it's sort of like the organization that responds to emergencies and disasters. So when we're talking about it, of course, I'm going to talk about Puerto Rico, but we're talking that PDA work and the organizations supported by PDA are from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina all the way to the conflict in Russia and Ukraine, from Guatemala all the way to Haiti after the earthquake, um, and of course now with um, the situations in Puerto Rico. So I get to work directly with our denomination, sharing what the work is being done locally and learning how the denomination can walk alongside us. So it's not about just you know funding things, but it's also um, a re like a, um, an opportunity for the church to reconnect with the churches in Puerto Rico. Our congregations in Puerto Rico are part of PCUSA, so this is just a good reminder that we're part of a bigger family. So we have different projects in Puerto Rico, and it is important that, um, that I remind you that there's been a lot of challenges since 2017. We were hit by Hurricanes Irma and Maria, something that was unprecedented, although we are used to, the, to having storms and hurricanes. We know the drill, but this was the aftermath was just uh, something that nobody had ever, ever experienced. Um, in 2020, the southwestern region also suffered a series of earthquakes, including a 6.4 earthquake and, at the beginning of the year. And then we were facing the pandemic. So how are we going to be, you know, every time rethinking how does recovery works in the midst of adding up all these situations? How can we walk alongside our churches and say, hey, everything is going to be okay. We're going to go through this as we are facing different things. So there are many ways that you can con connect with PDA and support it. One of them is, you know, donating and funding um, the program. So you can donate directly to PDA to the general fund, but you can also donate specifically for a particular disaster. So if you go to our website, you will see many different ways that you can support the work in PDA across the globe. Of course, when I'm, I'm here, um, one of the, the reasons uh, I'm here is because there's a group from this church that is going to be volunteering this summer. So another way to support the work is actually to go to those places and volunteer. Um, we are so happy that we get to reopen our host sites. You know, the pandemic really, really pushed the work that we were doing. We were almost hitting the 2,000 volunteer mark when the, the pandemic hit. So now we're hoping that we get to reconnect with those churches that weren't able to visit, to connect with new churches that want to go to Puerto Rico, and to have um, just new opportunities to receive volunteers. This is a great opportunity to connect and put the faces, you know, to the issues of Puerto Rico. There are so many things that are happening that if I, I will need many minutes permission to share that, right? But um, what I'm gonna l l let you or invite you to reflect is that um, there's still work to do. Um, there's a lot of things that are still recovering and it really, really resonated with me, the, the quote that we just started our wor worship, um, healing does not mean going back to the ways things were before and we have been facing a new normal many, many times in the last couple of years. So my invitation for this congregation, as you guys get ready to take a group uh, to volunteer, but also you have some people staying here, is to keep in the loop with the things that are happening in Puerto Rico, to follow through, to be ready to hear the stories from the group when they come back. And when we talk about that new normal, you're going to be able to be a part of that recovery. You're going to be able to be part of that conversation. And my hope is that you get to witness the real Puerto Rico. So when we talk about the way that we are healing uh, in the, the Puerto Rican people, my hope is that you get to witness that and you get to be a part of the healing of the people of Puerto Rico um, through a recovery that is filled with justice. So 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to let me be within you guys. It's not normal that I actually get to meet the volunteers be before they travel. So, you know, now I get to, you know, be biased and have some favorites during the summer. But um, I'll, try, I'll try to, you know, not to show that to other groups. But anyway, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to be here. And I'll be here uh, after worship if anybody wants to talk or chat or have any questions about what's going on uh, recovery-wise. Thank you so much. So we're going to do a couple of things right now. We're going to have the kids come up, but we also want to have our new members who are going to be joining with us. We're going to receive them formally. Eugene Ferguson, Peg Silloway, and Diana Bennett, if they're here today, would you please come up too and stand just to one side? Okay, I've got a little something going on in my throat. I've been tested for the loathsome disease we're all concerned about, and I'm just screen clear, and I can tell it doesn't feel like that at all anyway, but I'm keeping my mask on anyway. So, good to see you guys. There's a story today about Jesus in the Bible that's a wonderful story in which he goes to the state fair or the county fair, something like that. He goes to the festival time where everybody is having fun. What do you guys do when you go to a state fair or a county fair or the Rose Parade? What do you do? What? Get you treats. Get treats, right. Like what? Cotton candy? There you go, cotton candy. <laughs> oh, gosh, that cotton candy. I don't know about that. Uh, Right, caramel corn, all kinds of wild things. There's rides to go on and things. So Jesus is in the city of Jerusalem. There's a big thing going on. And where does he go? He remembers that real close to where they put the Ferris wheel <laughs> is a little pool of water, not where people swim, but where people have lived for years and years and years who can't walk or can't see or can't do other things. They're right there. That's where they live, and that's where people know to take some food once in a while if they want to be nice to the people who have special needs. So instead of going on the Ferris wheel, Jesus goes with those people. He remembers them. The story is about the fact that love remembers. Love remembers. We are gathering today with Michelle, who just spoke to us about the work in Puerto Rico because... We all remember that five years ago there was a terrible hurricane in Puerto Rico called Hurricane Maria, and it just did terrible things. And since then there have been fires and hurricanes and tornadoes, and there's Ukraine, and there's all these crazy things going on. But we still remember that we wanted, even before the COVID thing, we wanted to help those people in Puerto Rico because they're our brothers and sisters. Love is all about remembering. So I thought this time would be a perfect time for you guys to help me and other people in our church welcome some new members who are attracted to that kind of remembering love. And then after that, we're even going to bring up people who are our new elders and deacons because their job as elders and deacons is to be givers of that same kind of remembering love that Jesus was all about. So we're going to do those things right now. So uh, here. there you are. <laughs> there you are. Would you three come forward? I know Jean's here. Yeah, there she is. Okay. If, you, if it's too hard for you, you can just hang in there. You're okay? Okie dokie. Okay. And then I've got, right, Karen's going to help us too. Let me ask you these questions. Do you find the life and teachings of Jesus to be an inspiration and reminder that we live out of purposes larger than ourselves? Jean, Peg, and Diana, do you? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you do your best to be a disciple of his, showing his love? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Will you be faithful members of this congregation, sharing in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will. I will with God's help. And will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And a question for the congregation. <laughs> Do we, the members of Southminster Presbyterian Church, 
promise to extend gracious hospitality of the household of God to Jean, Peg, and Di, with God's help to live lives worthy of Jesus' care and love. If so, please say, we do. We do. All right. Welcome to this ministry. We adore you already, and we're so glad to have you part of this group. Would we give a welcome? Yeah. Now, we have the special uh, uh, joy and privilege of having Gene's former pastor from, uh, uh, from Colorado, who's here singing in our choir. Th that's Rebecca. Who oh, happens to be Dan Rasmussen's sister. So if any of you join another church, we need uh, either Don or I need an invitation to sing in their choir on the day you join. And we need to be related to somebody in the congregation, okay? So you got those two things. You got to be, you got that. Okay, here we go. Thank you so much. Welcome. And we're going to have a little party for them afterward at fellowship time. So join in that. There's cake. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. Now, will those of you who are elders and deacons who are coming on or, or re-upping, I got Vicki Lukic, Judy Wyden, Diana Bennett. Diana, come back up here. Oh, she's here already. Okay. Chris Muzong, June Carlson. Then our deacons, Janet Cruz is new deacon, and the, new, and the ones who are re-upping are Suzanne Angelo, Robin Erickson, and Linda Angala. If you aren't all here, we'll take care of it another day as well, because it always takes a couple of times to get everybody in line. All righty, here we go. We got a good group. Yeah, a circle's good. Circles are good. Okay, we got a few questions for you folks as well. These are old questions that go all the way back. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, acknowledge him head of the church, and through him believe in one God, if so say, I do? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of our Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church? If so, say, I do. And will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by him? If so, say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among these colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. I will. will you in your own life seek to follow Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Just a small job. If so, say, <laughs> I, I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. And will you pray for and seek to serve the people? This is my favorite one. With energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. If so, say, I will. I will. And will you be a faithful teaching elder, those of you, or deacons, those of you, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for our people? Will you be active in government and discipline? serving in the councils of our church and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. This is to the congregation. Do we, the members of the church, accept these elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. We do. do we agree to encourage them, respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide and care for us in the service of Jesus Christ. We do. And, and pay them fairly. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll double their wages because of inflation, right? <laughs> that's right. Okay, sorry about that. Please join me in... Uh, oh, that's right. Who is being ordained for the first time as an elder or deacon? Okay, wonderful. Would you please come right here in the middle where the children are? Right, come close together. I know it's it's still COVID time, but and you kids, if if you wouldn't mind reach coming around and reaching out and just touching one of them with your hand to bless them, I hope you're okay with that. Is that all right? If not, it's okay. Well, we'll we'll do it this way. That's good. Okay. And those of you who are elders and deacons, just raise your hands where you are. Stand if you can and raise your hand, and we'll bless them. We'll look Pentecostal today. This is good. Let us pray. 
Gracious and eternal God, with joy, we give you all thanks and praise. Throughout the ages, you have been faithful to this, your covenant people, whom you've called out of bondage and redeemed by your own love. In every time and place, you have chosen servants from among your people. And we are so grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. Gracious God, now pour out your spirit upon these, your servants, whom you've called through baptism. Give them special gifts to do your special work and fill them with your spirit so that they might have the same mind that was in Christ. Give them humility and humor and courage and an abiding sense of your presence. Gracious God, again, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon this whole church that we may be for you, holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. We pray all these things through the power of Jesus Christ. And all God's people were invited to say, Amen. Amen. You are duly ordained and called. And we look forward to everything that happens with our assembly. Thank you. Could you give a hand to these dear people too? Thank you, young people. Thank you for coming up. Wonderful. Wow, got to follow that one. The Greek Testament reading today comes from John 5, 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in, Jer Jerusalem, now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many ill blind, lame, and paralyzed people. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and though he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The ill man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the, into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. The theme reading today are the words of Rachel Naomi Remen. She is an author and teacher about alternative medicine, and she's also the founder of a medical student curriculum called The Healer's Art, used in medical schools throughout the United States. Her words are, Healing may not be so much about getting better as about letting go of everything that isn't you, all of the expectations, all of the beliefs, and becoming who you are.
Jerusalem was four square. God, thank you for uh, the wonderful joy of being together. It is a gift of this pandemic in some ways, too. We acknowledge that. Amen. Uh, I want to begin with a true story told by Jeff Anderson, uh, age 13, of San Antonio. It's 7.30 a.m., time to go to school. I pull on the blue warm-up jacket I wear every day, no matter what the weather. I care only about how I can hide beneath that loose-fitting blue jacket. I feel wrong. I feel fat. I bounce when I walk. I'm afraid to go to school, but this is America. I have no choice. I don't use the restroom at school. I don't answer questions in class. I practically don't exist. At lunch, I sit by myself and hope no one will pick a fight with me. Cynthia asks if she can join me. We are outcasts together. She eats my tater tots, grabbing them with her long fingernails, but I don't care. With her, at least, I'm not alone. People say I have a goofy walk. I'm so afraid of looking odd at times that I forget how to walk. There I'll be in the breezeway of Burnett Junior High, frozen, unable to remember how to swing my arms or breathe. Somehow I get the impression that each arm is supposed to move with the corresponding leg. I practice walking behind the six-foot-high six privacy fence in my backyard, making sure my right arm swings forward with my right foot. I practice so much that I make my walk worse. I get a new name, Robot Boy. Life is so hard for some people. It's so sad. And I'm thinking also of the man in the gospel, uh, this outcast, who has a, a tough go, too. In the story, as we have it from the gospel of John, there was a festival, as I said to the children of the Jews, in Roman-controlled Jerusalem. And Jesus went up to the city 
And doubtless, of course, there was entertainment, booths with toys made of wax and wood, you know, ceramic bowls, storage jars made of clay, lots of food booths, magicians. But on this particular day, Jesus goes to a place outside the festivities, a place for those who, who never celebrate, a place with five porticles full of mats upon which lay the blind and the lame. The gospel tells the story of a man who's paralyzed. He had planted himself beside a supposed magic pool 38 years before his, this day, and, and it's made explicit in the gospel. And he's still there, 38 years. That's longer than most people lived in the first century. Story says that Jesus, knowing that he'd been there a long time, asked him a question. Do you want to be healed? Does he want to be healed? My heavens, he's been camping there next to that healing pool for 38 years. It's a silly question. Or maybe not. Think about it. I mean, what would it mean for a man who had been in such a state and such a place for 38 years to be healed? I mean, imagine his life. If he were healed, he'd suddenly have to fetch his own meals. There'd be a whole new set of expectations for him. He'd have to make a living somehow on his own. So let me suggest that for Jesus to ask the question, do you want to be healed in this case, it's an act of empathy, of extreme compassion. And you know, Jesus is often identified with the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus, is, in fact, is, is uh, often stamped with the authorship of that phrase, but you can find a number of versions of it cropping up in cultures that go way back before Jesus. But let me just say that there are limits to the golden rule. And for my money, if Jesus is the author of any rule, it would have to be what's been known recently as the platinum rule. That one goes this way. Do unto others as they would be done by. Not do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Do unto others as they would have you do to them. That is to say, don't just do for people what you'd like. Take the time to find out what they might really want before you help, help them, right? Do you want to be healed? The truth is made perfectly clear in this story. Part of Jesus' integrity, I think, in fact, lies in the fact that he goes beyond the golden rule here. He does not give people what we think they, what he might think they want. He cares enough to ask them what they're willing or unwilling to accept. And I think his integrity is, in fact, measured by this kind of respectful behavior toward people in every station in life in regard to what he gives them. I remember being given a lesson on this during the first pastoral call I ever made on my second day in my first church long ago in the Cully neighborhood, in fact, of Portland. I was so incredibly green. I asked the office manager who in the congregation might appreciate a pastoral visit. And she said, Dorothy, it was a woman who lived only a block away from the church whose husband had passed away a couple of months before. So I'd met Dorothy, I remembered her, the day before, the Sunday when I had led worship there for the first time. Dorothy was very well dressed, proper woman, a devoted churchgoer. She'd nursed her husband faithfully for a number of years before he had died, I was told. She answered her door, and I immediately told her how sorry I was for her loss. And Dorothy didn't skip a beat. She said, don't be sorry, I'm not. <laughs> he was a skunk. <laughs> now I go dancing three times a week. I'm finally having a good time in life. <clears throat> so sometimes saying I'm sorry for your loss is the right thing to say. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a bit more complicated. I remember hearing of a 70-year-old man who had spent more than 30 years in prison. 
He was granted parole, but he wept and begged the parole board to rescind the order. The idea of being out on his own was not only uh, not welcome, it filled him with terror. You re might remember the, the actor James Whitmore playing just such a character in the Shawshank Redemption. Do you want to be healed? There's a hornet's nest behind that question. Let me tell you another reason why. I remember a Presbyterian minister over in Northeast who went around anointing people with oil, people who had cancer. He had his elders with him, and they'd do the anointing, and then they'd pray over him, and then he, the minister, would tell them that they were healed, but they needed still to appropriate their healing. That is, he would say, if you have enough faith, you'll get well. If not, no healing for you. So this left many, if not most of them, not only sick, but also guilt-ridden, thinking they just didn't have enough faith. I knew some of these people, and I had to try to clean up that minister's messes sometimes. It was appalling. It was an outrage. It was gross malpractice. Now that said, when it comes to disease, I believe there are, in fact, people sometimes who choose, strangely, not to get well. It's a tricky subject. I know a woman, in fact, grown now, who when she was all of six years old was hospitalized for many months with hepatitis A. She swears that she spent much longer in the hospital than she needed to, and all because she willed herself not to get better. She told me she'd overheard her parents talking early in her illness about their desire to divorce. And she thought that as long as she was very sick, they'd stay together. Do you want to be healed? Not always. We make all manner of choices in this world, right? And they're not always maybe the best choices, heaven knows. Sometimes we make choices that are just sad. Think of, think of Robot Boy and the story I began with. We've all heard of abused children who marry people very like their abusive parent, right? The choice may not be good, but it may seem at first to be at least comfortable. We all of us choose our own familiar demons. Do you want to be healed? The lame man in the gospel story does not answer Jesus' question directly. He is, in fact, pretty defensive. I have no one to put me in the pool when the water's troubled. I'm lame. I can't get there. It's a catch-22. Maybe he's really saying something like, I have no one to put me in the water. I have no one. And because I have no one, I'm not at all sure. I want to get better. I've come to believe that uh, the possibility of wellness and sickness often has to do with who you have around you, family or friends to help you, to hear what you know, the doctors are saying when you just can't quite hear the doctor, you're too much in shock or too preoccupied with something. Family or friends, you know, are needed to advocate for you, too, to make you more than just part of the hospital census. Sometimes that person can be, you know, a complete stranger, a, an angel of sorts. I remember a woman who lost both legs in the Boston bombing. Initially, she was just glad they'd saved her life. But then, because they couldn't save her legs, she began dwelling sadly on her loss, just as you and I would have as well. And then a soldier who had lost both legs in Iraq came to visit her, came in on his two prostheses without even a limp. He said, I was, I was just where you are, and look at me now. And then he danced a little for her. You can do this, he said. And she said that was the moment it all turned around for her. Pretty soon she was able to gather up the courage to say, maybe I can be as good or maybe even better than I was. 
And you know, sometimes life provides little angels that really humble us on the way to giving us the, a needed lift. This story is told in the first person by Nancy Berkey. She writes, When I was very ill, I had to receive weekly intravenous treatments. This went on for almost two years. Somewhere in the middle, I lost my courage. It's hard to say which collapsed first, my soul or my veins. But collapse they both did. And one day the search for a healthy vein became too painful. And I pushed the needle away and cried. The nurse asked to let her introduce me to a young girl of about 10 who had lived with cancer all her life and who was also there that day receiving treatment. This child came in the room and smiled at me and said, you should have got one of these. And lifting her t-shirt, she showed me the hole that had been cut into her stomach so that she could receive her treatments through a permanent plastic port. Then she put her hand on, on me, small and soft, and said, you can take it. And I did. Do you want to be healed? What in the end does that mean? I remember seeing Magic Johnson on 60 Minutes a lot of years ago, remember? He, he was talking about his HIV, and he said something interesting. He said, you know, I'm healed, but I'm not cured. Which raised more questions than it answered, right? Then he said, you know, I, I know I'm going to be all right. Because fear was... Fear of AIDS, I mean, was, was not dominating his life anymore. It was, was not the central issue determining who he was. Magic Johnson is, in fact, a more interesting person than he was before he found out he had HIV. He has more soul. He has more depth. He knows what's really important. And that is the gift he got from getting in touch with his own mortality. I've quoted the Sufi prophet Rumi before, where he says, don't turn your head. Keep looking at the bandaged place. That's where the light enters you. Do you want to be healed? I can tell you from experience as well, illness, I know, can be so insidious. It can so take over your outlook that everything else about you gets lost. Well, this morning's reading from the Gospel of John says that the lame man had for, quote, for 38 years been in his sickness. That's the Greek, the literal Greek. For 38 years he'd been in his sickness. He had been swallowed by it, just as you and I get swallowed at times by such things. We become tempted to believe that we're sick and that's it, but we, in the end, need not let that happen completely. And often, you know, as I've been intimating, it takes an angel or two to talk us out of it. Someone to call us like Jesus does, the man, to go beyond it. So let me close with one more story of just such uh, an angel. It's by Donna Markova who tells her own story about her own special angel. She says, when I was in the hospital, the one person whose presence I welcomed was a woman who came to sweep the floors with a large push broom. She was the only one who didn't stick things in me and take things out or ask stupid questions. For a few minutes each night, this immense Jamaican woman rested her broom against the wall and sank her body into the turquoise plastic chair in my room. All I heard was the sound of her breathing, in and out, in and out. It was comforting in a strange and simple way. My own breathing calmed. 
Of the 50 or so people that made contact with me in any given day, she was the only one who wasn't trying to change me. One night, she reached out and put her hand on the top of my shoulder. I'm not usually comfortable with casual touch, but her hand felt so natural being there. It happened to be one of the few places in my body that didn't hurt. I could have sworn she was saying two words with each breath, one on the inhale and one on the exhale. As is. As is. On her next visit, she looked at me. No evaluation, no, no trying to figure me out. She just looked at me and saw me. Then she said simply, you're more than the sickness in that body. I was pretty doped up, so I wasn't quite sure I understood her. But my mind was just too thick to ask questions. So I kept mumbling those words to myself throughout the following day. I'm more than the sickness in this body. I'm more than the suffering in this body. I remember her voice clearly. It was rich, deep, full like maple syrup in the spring. I reached out for her hand. It was cool and dry. I knew she wouldn't let go. She continued. You're not the fear in that body. You're more than that fear. Float on it. Float above it. You're more than that pain. I began to breathe a little deeper, as I did when I wanted to float in a lake. I remembered floating in Lake George when I was five. Floating in the Atlantic Ocean at Coney Island when I was seven. Floating in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa when I was 28. Without any instruction from me, this Jamaican guide had led me to a source of comfort that was wider and deeper than pain or fear. It's been 15 years since I've seen the woman with the broom. I've never been able to find her. No one could remember her name. But she touched my soul with her compassionate presence and her fingerprints are there still. So, what is it that dogs you in life? I mean, what's unresolved for you? Unresolved in a way that sometimes hurts. What's keeping you from being really healthy? Have you had this wound for a long time? Maybe, maybe a year, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 or maybe 38. Ask yourself the question, what's going on? Dare to ask the question, do I want to be healed? might be the most important question we ever ask ourselves. Amen.
to be seated. And what is it you'd like to have prayer for at this time? Joys and concerns. Yes. Daughter's partner had back surgery last week. Daryl. Okay. And I have a joy. Oh, great. We have a prodigal grandson that has returned to the family after two years. Oh, gosh. Okay. Good news. All right. Others? Joys and concerns? Yeah. Oh, right there. We, that will help you get on Zoom. I have so. a joy. My yes. oldest granddaughter is graduating from college. All right. In Montreal. Which is really Wonderful. Good. Okay. Thank you. Warren. My niece just got married to a wonderful fellow, and we had a great family occasion. All right. Pray for new relationship. Oh, Pam. Yeah. Right there. Sitting next to me is my cousin Keith, who is visiting from San Diego. And we've had a very nice time. And I'm delighted we had a very nice time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the undercurrents, you know, they just come right up. <laughs> Families are wonderful. I love them. Good yes. morning. I'm um, always using too many words because I have a great deal of gladness, and there is sadness there for, I'm not sure where that comes from. But my gratitude is overflowing. Ever since I told Rebecca at our church in Colorado, we're moving. Where are you going? Oregon. Oh, where in Oregon? Beaverton. Oh, that's where my brother lives. Now, that was a miracle, folks. I could not have created in all of the earth. And um, I am, it's a God thing, and I have experienced so many of those in your sermon this morning, as all of them are, Pastor, told me what I needed to hear. I'm in line for two new knees and a new oh. hip, and oh. I've oh. actually enjoyed the steadiness I have with my walker, <laughs> and, uh, and people are so courteous to me. Doors are opened and everything, you know, and I honestly had some moments, and you have to pay for it, and all these kinds of but you know what? You've, you've covered all the bases, as you always do, <laughs> body, mind, uh -oh. and spirit. And I'm so grateful that Rebecca is here today. And thank you, Dan. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. OK. I actually have one myself. I'm uh, sorry you can't. You're the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so. My dad's been wrestling with cancer for about 15 years now. Oh, gosh. And uh, they knocked it back pretty hard, but uh, it, uh, it's coming back. And this is probably the final, the final round. And so um, my prayer request is not for him, because uh, he, like you, <laughs> I think, understands that healing is a complicated thing. My prayer request is for my mother who is devastated. Okay. Well, we'll pray for you, too, if that's okay. So my niece and her partner, who is Ukrainian, um, are going to spend the summer over in Poland. Um, they're leaving next week to uh, help out as they can. So oh, okay. prayers for them. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, as a... I was privileged yesterday to uh, attend. Yeah. To attend the services for Glenn Corcoran. Many of you may remember him as a, a member for many years ago, uh, and he was my favorite poker and golf partner. Oh gosh. And it was a wonderful service. Uh, I got to meet family, which I'd never met before, and just ask you to say prayers for Becky and the rest of the family. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, Pat. We have a, a Joy, a granddaughter who has graduated from 
Villanova uh, in, in both math and education. So she has another year to get her teaching de degree. And she got a job with a research professor that's going to pay her tuition and give her some money each month in addition. Ooh. So yeah. A that's job. Pretty nice. <laughs> I'm praying with gratitude and concern. Um, Andy learned that even if you set the brakes on the wheelchair, you can still fall backward and hit your head on the floor, which oh he no. demonstrated this morning. Oh no. So prayers for lessons and oh my uh, God. help. All right. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we lift up the rest of the prayers that have not been asked. Oh, let me ask uh, folks, I'm sorry, uh, folks online. Anybody? Nothing there? Okay, let's join again. So, Lord, we pray for other prayers that we might have in our hearts that we haven't had whatever it is uh, to, to utter in this space but are still uh, with us. We lift up all the young people who are graduating now, uh, glad to be done with certain tasks but also uncertain about the future. We lift up those who are seeking treatment and those in their final stages of, of disease. We lift up families of all kinds and uh, know that um, it's often in families we learn what love is and at the same time we find challenges to boot. We pray your grace upon this world, all those things that uh, call us to prayer we pray for the people of Puerto Rico and all those and, uh, uh, that are part of this uh, extended congregation who are readying themselves to go do ministry. May they be ministered to as well and be uh, heir of experiences that might change their hearts in ways that are wonderful. We pray all these things in the name of the one who calls us to prayer, uh, praying together this prayer of Brett Myers. O oh God, our divine parent, may your presence be ever revered. May your peace and justice dwell among us. May your love and compassion live within and between us. Nourish us daily with the necessities of life, sustenance for our bodies and inspiration for our spirits. And may the forgiveness we give be that which we receive. The kindness we show be that which we perceive. Lead us on virtuous paths and distance us from evil. For our world is, your world is our world, and your reign our reign, then, now, and always. Amen. We'll receive now our morning's offering.
Remember that life indeed is short and we have not much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds today and tomorrow and down all our days. Our service is ended, but we invite you to linger for the postlude and please stay to welcome our new members. Thank you. 